Last week, we put out our endurance episode with former TTT coach and exercise physiologist, Evan Pycar. And since we made the long trek out to Providence, Rhode Island, we thought we'd get our money's worth from this episode about the rise of AI. Will it destroy us and how will it impact fitness? Enjoy. Evan, Evan's been in this basement writing songs. For All right, the last so last, fi- last time, fellas, we were talking about endurance, and we said at the end of that episode, hey, we might have time to do another one. Well, surprise, we had time. Here we are. And when we left off, you had told us about you, Evan, our guest here, if you didn't watch the last one, has two sub stacks. What were they again? So one is called On Human Performance. It's exactly what it sounds like. Anything related to <laughs> sports performance. Yeah, I Got mean, it. pretty straightforward. The other one's called Decoding Biology where I teach people how to program machine learning systems for biomedical applications. Boom. So right now in the world, machine learning is all the rage, Mm -hmm. AI, artificial intelligence. And so, you know, we're all in this room interested in it. Me and Kyle, I mean, just right now, it's like not all we could talk about, but it comes up a lot and it's just fun to talk about. So when you said that blog, it's like, man, let's just have a legit conversation on the mics Mm -hmm. where we're just asking the questions we want. So what prompted you to start that? Uh, Substack. Yes. So, I mean, part of the Substack is more of the best way for me to learn is by teaching other people things. I think that was really, I mean, one of the benefits in TTT's education course is like, how do you know so much physiology? Because I taught people physiology for 10 years. So it was the same thing. Yeah. Learning how to, I was interested in using machine learning for biological applications. It's like, well, stay committed to this. I'm just going to teach other people the things that I've learned along the way. So, before that, I spent a year studying this and then started just producing content and teaching. And that really forced me to uh, explain my thinking in more clear ways. So why did systems. you want to get into it though? Like what prompted that? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, a big part of it is obviously in my career, I work with like wearables collecting biological data. And one of the things that you realize really quickly is biology is really messy and really complicated. So the amount of data that you'll get from a single person, let alone a group of people, and the complexity of the data is so high that even though humans evolved for pattern recognition, it is beyond the patterns that you'll ever be able to conceive with your own mind. And at the time, I was like, well, that's interesting. The fact that there's codes in our DNA or in our physiological patterns, we have heartbeats, muscle movements, electrical responses in our body, all of these things happening all the time. So I was interested, could we build sensors to measure those things? Yeah. That in and of itself is cool. Answer is yes, in most cases. Yeah. But what use is that? Well, that's what you ended up doing, right? And that's what I ended up doing. So for people who didn't, I think we talked about it right there at Mm -hmm. the tail end of the last episode, if you haven't Mm -hmm. seen it. But basically, what was the thing that you figured out how to do? Uh, Measure nitric oxide release from red blood cells non-invasively and in real time. Yeah. What the hell did y'all do today? <laughs> like, I, I made a video of a guy working out. This man's over here <laughs> figuring out whatever he just said. <laughs> so beyond that, I mean, yeah, you can measure all of these things in the body. Cool. It's engineering. But could you decode the signals? Like there are patterns. There's meaningful data on all of that. But we're not going to be able to look at that data and make any sense of it. I mean, if you think of like each individual data point or type of data that you have as a dimension, we could think in what, three dimensions? What if you have a thousand dimensions? Are you going to be able to, you know, imagine like a vaporous cloud of data? No, like you're not going to do anything with that. that's where machine learning comes in? That's where machine learning comes in. So what's interesting about machine learning is people think like, oh, AI is going to take over the world. It could do all these things. Interestingly, the things that we're really good at doing, machine learning is awful at. Okay. Give me an example of that. Cause I've so, heard that said many times. Yeah. So there's, um, a great quote, uh, books my, called mind children. It's like an early pioneer of AI. And I think the 1970s. So one of his quotes is that in like the sensory areas, so seeing things and being able to identify that's a cat, not a school bus, uh, feeling things, tasting Unless you're watching things. My Neighbor Totoro. Unless you're watching Hey-o. My Neighbor Totoro. Yeah. I mean, that's it's both a great example. It is both. <laughs> yes. I mean, machine learning is not going to figure that out. It's going to say one or the other, but even things like right now, you can't digitize your sense of taste. There's nothing you could do. So your sense of smell, you can't digitize it. So machines never going to be able to interpret things. I smell this. This is what it is. So we're all like Olympians in the sensory world. What we're really bad at is parsing really complex data. Our brains didn't evolve for that. What machines are really great at is parsing really complex data. So the way that it's best understood is that 
understanding really complex data is actually not that difficult. It's a very simple task. It's just humans are really bad at it. We're poorly equipped to understand We're poorly complex equipped. data. What we Why do, is that? Because there's no evolutionary pressure to be able to think about a thousand dimensions of data. So what we're good at seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing, we are so far beyond the capability of machines in a lot of cases. So what I was interested in is, well, could we take advantage of what we're good at? Could we take advantage of what machines are good at? And it's the marriage of those two, like a human machine interface. So from like a wearable tech standpoint, that's one thing, be able to measure things that our senses can't do. What do we do with that data? That's where machine learning comes in. Okay, let's take a pause though right there. So we promise we'll, we'll talk about performance and uh, machine learning and AI mm -hmm. in this podcast. But you mentioned that right now there's a lot of like doom mm -hmm. of people, you know, AI is going to take over the world. Um, where do you think that comes from and what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, so I think one that comes from just kind of like a misunderstanding of what it really is. Like we hear AI, artificial intelligence, it's actually a really bad term. There's no intelligence in the systems. It's literally math. It's algebra. Some people are scared. AI is going to take over the world. We need AI to be aligned with our intentions. What you're basically saying is algebra is going to take over the world. <laughs> algebra is needs to be aligned with our intentions. It's kind of nonsensical. So I think a lot of that is people are very impressed by things like chat GPT. It feels like there's an intelligence behind it when you're talking to it. Yeah. It, what, so for I've, people who never use it, Kyle, tell them what it what it does. Yeah. So Chat GPT, it's called a linguistic model, but to to break it down, basically it's a, a chat window that you can mm -hmm. ask questions of and and say, you know, generate me a a blurb on mm -hmm. uh, mitochondrial density and exercise, and it digs well, into its database and it, and it, and it actually creates some fairly well written and, mm -hmm. and well spoken content yeah. on exactly whatever you ask about. Yeah. And it's the new hot things people are being able to use in the general population. What they don't realize is the autocorrect in your iPhone has been doing that for 10 years. It's the same thing. So the way this works, if I type in mitochondria, finish the sentence for me. Well, it's going to look through all of the data on the internet that's trained on. It will say, density. okay, exactly. And it will say, why is it going to choose density? Because out of all the times if we feed it thousands of books, thousands of articles that have the word mitochondria, it's going to say, what is the most likely word to come after mitochondria based on all of the information in the system? It's probably density. Yeah, they're prediction models is how I understand it. It says density. What is the next most likely word to happen probabilistically? If I said mitochondrial density, now it's the next most likely word. And we'll just start generating sentences so that seem intelligent. So we go online and just type in your name, Evan Pycon. Freaking rules, a whole bunch. <laughs> so what's funny is if you ask chat GPT who I am, because of the people that have been associated with, it's actually really funny because sometimes it will say, Evan Pycon worked for training think tank. He's well known for using near infrared spectroscopy with athletes. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. And then you'll ask again, it will say, Evan Pycon is a famous ultra marathon or he's best known for completing the Badwater Marathon. Why does it say that? Because there are podcast notes from podcasts I've been on where we've talked about ultra marathons yeah. and the Badwater Marathon. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's see, literally making up nonsense information based on... It's not nonsense if you consider it from the AI's perspective. It is right. saying is this statistically... Is what people call the hallucinations? Yeah, the hallucinations where it's like, it's not really a hallucination. That's actually a feature, not a bug. That's literally what it's built to do because it doesn't know what it's saying. There's no meaning associated with this. So literally just math and statistics making a prediction. Okay, so you said that AI is a bad name for it, that intelligence is not something that it has. But I've heard the argument that basically what, you know, a chat GPT mm -hmm. does or, or current levels of AI is they go and they access information that already exists mm -hmm. and then use prediction models to create a mm -hmm. new quote thought, yeah. right? Um, but how's that much different than what the human brain does, right? So like for mm -hmm. you to create a, a novel thought, really what mm -hmm. you're doing is accessing your experiences and information and memory and then generating, you know, this novel mm -hmm. thought or this novel mm -hmm. idea, but it's not really novel in the sense that it's all based on your experience yeah. and information that you've gathered you're absolutely before. Right. Like everything is reductive. Cause it's like, if I come up with an idea right now, obviously there are some ideas that really are unique, but usually it's based on things that you've learned before, things that you've heard but there's a uh, pressure testing as you're generating an idea. So I'm not just going to think right now, Kyle, if I train you to improve your mitochondrial density, you're going to become a unicorn. That's not <laughs> okay. going to make sense because in my mind, I know what the constraints are. I know what these words mean. Or with ChatGPT, if I write enough articles, 
about how improving your mitochondrial density will make you a unicorn. I get enough people to do that. I get all my friends and I recruit them and we start producing this content. ChatGPT will start telling you that that's what you could so do. So that's how the world's going to end is that unicorn destruction. That's probably the most likely case. And I'm prepared for it. I actually have my plan for what to do in that case. I'm not going to tell you guys what oh. it is. <laughs> Jefferson I mean, curls. Jefferson curls are a part of it. Nice. It's not the whole story though. All right. So what, why are people freaking out then? <laughs> Honest answer is probably because Elon Musk is in the news so often. Yeah. But he hasn't been that doom and gloom, right? He's he just has like a slant. doom or gloom. He oh, has been quoted yeah. as saying AI is summoning the demon. Yeah. Um, he believes that it is going to. Well, why would you assume someone at, I mean, he's not dumb, is he? Maybe. He's <laughs> not dumb. Well, I think. But why would someone at that level, who's definitely smarter than me, so be caught up on that? He's a really big fan and actually funds a lot of the work of a philosopher named Nick Bostrom, who's not a computer scientist, does not understand how AI systems work. And he speaks more in a. Is that, guy, is that the guy who works with Yukowski? Eliezer? I don't know if he works with him, but he's a professor, I think, Oxford or Cambridge. So he thinks more from like a philosophical perspective. Hypothetically, if we really did create a super intelligence, like a true super intelligence, so like a science fiction sense, what are all the possible scenarios? And there is some doom and gloom there. And what I don't think people realize is that that is so far disconnected from what artificial intelligence in the way people speak about or machine learning is that it's almost like two totally separate things that fundamentally the systems that people build have nothing to do with that. It's such like a sci-fi or abstract concept that. So it's, it's basically like where the, the state of AI now or the state of machine mm -hmm. learning, artificial intelligence would you, you would say is not even moving in the direction that we need to worry about AI yeah. doing like, I, I know you've probably heard of like the paperclip problem yeah. where you're like optimized production of paperclips. You tell AI to optimize mm -hmm. production of paperclips and then it destroys the world and, mm -hmm. and earth is covered in paperclips. Yeah. And, and yeah. That's Nick Bostrom's one that came yeah. up with that argument. It's the same thing. Like people talk about chat GPT, like where is this going to go in 10 years from now? Things like that. It keeps accelerating. What they don't realize is one chat GPT is not profitable and they're really pushing to the limits. You mean open AI? Open AI is not profitable. Makes chat GPT. Yeah. yeah. And they've made many other products as well, some more successful than others. But basically, they're really pushing the limits of what is computationally possible to build. So it's more likely in the future is that people for less, much less money and much less power and resources are going to make much more niche specific applications so of like the technology. So like super sick autofill bots that'll basically yeah. make it like we, we said we'd connect it back to training i have always thought that the the idea of having like a training autofill where it's mm -hmm. like you know you you fill out or you build a template for mm -hmm. a client and then ask it to create the training based on the template where mm -hmm. you're still directing the, the thought like the coach who has the mm -hmm. experience and the sensory right you can go out and watch the client yeah. and and have that you know the sensory component and then have the linguistic models mm. or, or the machine learning models autofill that like yeah. that's a realistic possibility yeah. or even think about like, yes, that would definitely be a possibility. But another version would be, um, have you ever seen on TV on the news when there's like a 30 car pile up on the freeway? And like, for yeah. example, watching that, you understand the mechanics of the collision, you understand the physics, but like there's so many interdependencies going on that you would never be able to predict that or prevent it from happening. In, in the same way, like some days an athlete goes into the gym and they hit a humongous PR. It's not predicted. Another athlete goes and they tear their ACL. And one we call unlucky, one we call very lucky, but we couldn't have really shaped either of those events. They're almost uh, seemingly random. What you could do with the degree of pattern recognition in these systems is there's so many things going on in athletes' training, nutrition, lifestyle, dot, 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 et cetera. So imagine an athlete is a wearable device. And he hits you with the dot, 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 and the et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. It's the one-two punch. So they have wearable data. They're tracking their macros, for example. They have their training log. And, you know, you're letting things play out over time. Eventually, you'll have enough data that if X happens in training, it could be I increased reps by this much on this event, that type of thing you could predict what is the most likely thing to occur after this based on the data. We know there's dozens, hundreds of different things happening simultaneously, but have we seen an event like this before? 
in could we figure out what is likely to occur? Kind of like the autofill. Yeah, so you could almost be like projecting into the future knowing if I now give an athlete this, you could even simulate it. If I do this in an athlete's training and that happens, what's likely to occur next? So when you're programming for athletes, I mean, we're trying to do that intuitively, Yeah. but in a more robust way than what we would be able to do ourselves and think of how you could use that for peaking and tapering. If I do this, what happens then? How do I know which day that they're going to be optimized uh you might want to watch it. my cat doesn't climb into your camera bag and get <laughs> oh it's okay okay I'll just take him home well to that point we've actually talked about this before where we have like a set of rules so a, a great example is if an athlete hit starts to hit multiple prs you know they go on that mm-hmm. pr train where it's like yeah you know they pr their back squat then a couple days later they pr their clean and jerk and then they pr their snatch it's like it's very clear that if a deload does not happen shortly after that 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 athlete's going to get injured mm-hmm. right because we've seen that happen enough where like pr yeah. pr pr boom injury happens right mm-hmm. afterwards so basically what you're saying is AI, machine learning, those type of things allow us to monitor a much wider set mm-hmm. of data than yeah. just, hey, this athlete's hitting some PRs and their training log scores are like, they're a 10 out of 10. Mm-hmm. You know, they say every day their yeah. training feels amazing, but that doesn't give us a lot of information. Our experience tells mm-hmm. us that when someone is that 10 out of 10 and they're PR, 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 that the likelihood of injury is mm-hmm. very high shortly yeah. afterward. But this would be like, much more uh, defined and give mm-hmm. us a lot more granularity to be able to like make good predictions yeah. about potential injuries or when those PR cycles mm-hmm. might happen. Yeah, like make accurate forecasts. Yep. You want to jump in? No, no. Just pull your mic. Yeah. And then you could even do things like say we're talking about open performance. So we have, I mean, at this point, how many people are doing the open? Like so we'll say a quarter million. Okay. A quarter year. million. So we have a quarter million people's data. So let's say we have all of their open scores. We have a bunch of their training data, like snatch PR, 2K, dot, 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 et cetera we could say what percentage of variance in open scores could we attribute to this movement or this type of quality? So what we might find is, wow, 60% of open performance differences between people are attributed to like these two things. And they're not the things that we would have thought they were. There was a guy in, in 20, I want to say it was like 2012, 13 and 14. mm -hmm. He had a website called, CrossFit games data or CrossFit game mm-hmm. stats or CFG stats, something like that. And that's one of the things he did. And it was, he always ran these regression analysis mm-hmm. and he would, he would basically say like this year, sn- your snatch, your one mm-hmm. RM snatch predicted like 90% of performance, which made yeah. sense in those years because yeah, I think 2012 heavy and, snatch and 2013, yeah. you know, there was an open workout that had snatches that went up to mm-hmm. what was well beyond most people's one RM yeah. snatch. And so like that predicted the majority mm-hmm. of, of performance, but he, he did basically that, but probably not to the, the level and degree that you're mm-hmm. talking about. Cause I don't think it was machine learning based. Mm-hmm. It was more just like basic statistics, regression analysis type stuff. Yeah, and the reality is, is most machine learning is just based on fundamental statistics. So you could get fancy. A lot of times the simple things perform the best. So recently I was working with It was a project I published the data and you could see like the steps of how I made it, but basically took fMRI data from people. So, you know, you do a brain scan and you have things like age, sex, height, weight, kind of these like general factors that you would collect for someone. And what I was trying to do is predict uh, what is their clinical dementia rating score? So that's something used in medicine. Like you put people through assessments and you say, what is their degree of neurodegeneration, cognitive impairment? So what I was trying to see is if we were to put someone in a brain scan, could we predict their clinical dementia rating score? So I tried all of these different machine learning models, like tweaked all these different parameters. We could get into the details of what that actually means. But at the end of the day, what ended up performing best was a linear regression. We're talking like if you took uh, statistics your freshman year in college, using a linear regression was actually the best way to predict dementia based on these data points. So basically just getting an R squared value for... Yeah, it was basically like a multivariable regression, but like nothing super crazy. So like sometimes it is pretty simple statistics end up being the things that work. But you, you know, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do with machine learning when you make predictions is take the underlying data, figure out the structure of the data and how to best predict an outcome variable for that. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Well, you were telling us uh, yesterday that the Knox device that you're working with or work or created mm-hmm. is um, doing machine learning to help injury prevention. Yeah. So that's what was that again. 
Yeah, so that's that we is, will not be for the average person. So that'd be something that we're going to work on with sports teams. And over time, we might roll that out. But yeah, essentially, in general, what we're looking to do with different applications is use machine learning to one, help interpret data. Like one of the things that's hard about like physiologic data collection is if someone, maybe they either don't have the like know how to analyze it, which is one thing, or they do and they don't have the time or energy. Like that's a real concern too. Mm-hmm is using machine learning to automate a lot of the data analysis. But over time, what we want to do as well is make predictions on the data. So, oh, Chris, we're looking at the past two weeks of your training data. We are predicting that you are going to get injured if you do X, Y, or Z. And how were you able to figure that out? Like, So part of that is, um, let's not use injury for this example. Okay. Let's say uh, we want to predict uh, that you're going to have a really great race performance. So we kind of like the opposite of an injury. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're (laughs) trying to predict your best day. Predict performance rather than. Yeah. 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 So we would look at your training data, like your actual real sets, reps. What are you doing? We look at your physiologic data. And what we do on our end is we would flag that. That could either be a person doing that or a machine say, okay, so this day Chris did X, Y, or Z. This is what his data looked like. This was a great training day. Um, Plus five pounds on his back squat, whatever. You have enough people do that and enough data, and we could start to find all the patterns within the data that predict the outcome. So you might have like 20 inputs, this happened, that happened, I did this, that, and the other thing. And then this is the outcome that we're measuring. If you have enough data for a single person, enough data for multiple people, you could start to predict, well, today I went in the gym, I did five by five at this weight, I rested that much, X, Y, or Z happened, this is my nearest data we could start to accurately predict, well, this is what's going to happen tomorrow because we've seen enough patterns like this. Mm. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but sure. that's really like the basics of how it works. So how far away are we from a model that can predict performance and recovery? Because I've read a lot of the research on you know wearables like mm-hmm. Whoop and Omega Wave yeah. and, and compared to a subjective score, the subjective scores... Mm-hmm. Still, like even even as of you know twenty twenty two research, are still superior in predicting performance Mm. and and injury and recovery and overtraining. Like so, literally personal experience, your ability. So just doing simple things like taking a profile of mood states, which Mm. measures like you know how much aggression you have, how much depression. Like simple simple subjective tests, or even a one to ten scale of how you feel, tend to be better predictors as of last year how far away are we from from that so i'll say it's not one or the other so what we're saying is measuring certain physiologic variables are not as good predictors of performance as measuring certain subjective variables so it's not machine learning versus subjectivity it could be a machine learning model trained on your subjective variables where the inputs are i feel this that you know why is that better? Well, your sense has evolved over hundreds of millions of years to be really good at predicting how you feel. You know, that has an evolutionary advantage. In the input data in a lot of these cases, things like heart rate variability, um, skin temperature, blood oxygenation, they're not very good inputs for predicting performance because they don't really have strong physiologic corollaries to it, aside from the fact that measuring heart rate variability is a lot harder than you think. For example, I wear an Apple Watch. The reason why the heart rate variability measurement just isn't that useful is it randomly samples it throughout the day. There's no standardization of measurements. So it says today at 3 p.m., Evan's heart rate variability was 85 milliseconds. Yesterday at 1 p.m., it was 100 milliseconds. Evan is very stressed today because his heart rate variability is depressed. No, yesterday at 1 o'clock, I was taking a nap. Today I'm working. Two very different contexts. It doesn't mean that I'm more stressed or more taxed. It just means that you're comparing apples to oranges. So you're to that point. I think this is probably important to to discuss. But your your heart rate variability isn't stable throughout the day. Hence no. the idea that it's heart rate variability, variability, right? So it's that. It's that. I mean, you could use machine learning on subjective data, and I think there's actually a lot of utility in that for predicting performance. So it's your model's only as good as the data that you put into it. Like if I built a model and the inputs were, Kyle, what's your favorite color? I was going to say your favorite color of ice cream. What's your favorite color, your favorite (laughs) Uh, flavor of ice cream? And I'm going to try and predict whether or not you get dementia. 
it's probably not going to work that well. Those things probably aren't correlated with dementia. So that's a big part of it. I can tell you one thing about color and ice cream. You eat blue ice cream. When you go number two later in the day, you're going to have a green surprise. So that's interesting. I would have thought it would have been blue. Well, I mean, it depends on how much you had, I guess. Green, blue. Green, blue. Okay. Okay. I'm a little colorblind, so I have trouble differentiating (laughs) those two. But um, so yeah, predicting performance, you know, get good data. Predicting endurance performance, strength, that's going to be simple. Now, CrossFit, that's really hard because one of the things that we need to consider is, I'm not going to say all, most machine learning models need the inputs to be numerical. So for example, if we had like a snatch, a clean and jerk, a back squat, we need to turn those into numbers. You get what I'm saying? Like- It would be, for example, if we were trying to predict an output, male or female, we might want to convert that into a zero or one. So now we're using models to predict numbers that we assign values to. Think about how complicated that gets with CrossFit 1. All these different movements, all these different rep schemes, how do we even define an improvement in performance? Is it that in your Metcon, you did your 10 wall balls faster, faster overall time, faster rep speed, like... You know, we don't even really have a standardized definition of what performance in CrossFit means. So, you know, you're so going to try to math it out and yeah, like, put it into some Boolean algebra, you'd just be screwed. Yeah, like we would first need to settle what are we even saying is an improvement in performance because you could also get better at this first open workout and worse at the second if you repeat it. Is that better? Is better only when you improve both of them? Is it your open ranking independent of your score? Like... That's yeah, I mean, this is why, like, if you were to tell me, like, we're going to try and build a model to do this for CrossFit, I'd be like, eh, I'm going to go work with these endurance athletes because that seems a lot easier to do. It's more predictable, right? Because in, the the events that they're, they're performing in, are predictable. And even in CrossFit, it's going to be historic. So maybe somehow we build the perfect model at predicting your score in last year's open, these different things. It's not going to be relevant for the next year's open. Because it's different demands and different definition of success. Well, one of the things, speaking of prediction that you were talking about yesterday is that using machine learning, there would be potentially some ability to predict what type of workouts would come out and biases and things like that. So I would say if a single person was making the open workouts every year and they're just in their mind saying like, I'm randomly making up workouts. So imagine Castor is just back in charge and always Mm -hmm. has been of writing all the workouts for for the CrossFit game series. So I think if you had enough data, you could probably, if he made this the first open workout, this could be the second. But if we think about how many opens there have been, probably less than 15, which means, you know, somewhere in the range of 70 open events, it's not a lot of data. We need thousands and thousands and maybe tens of thousands of examples here. Hey, we got a friend. Who is this? I got a cat joining This is uh, Tolstoy. Look at him. What a guy. Tolstoy wouldn't say hi to me earlier, and now... Tolstoy, you have any uh, opinions on AI? All right, we'll see you later. (laughs) Privet, comrade. So it sounded like... so. Let's take it back. So I know that one of the most interesting things, like you were saying, CrossFit might be an anomaly because there's so much going on, Mm. but you were saying maybe in like bodybuilding or endurance, it's kind of like a little more cut and dry things that are a little more concrete. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of the benefits of being able to measure these things would be it telling, like knowing that we're different every day we show up. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're not coming the same. Like, so what, what, what might be good for me to do one day might be different the next it might be different for me and Kyle, mm-hmm. but right now without being able to measure anything or have the ability mm-hmm. to, to keep yeah. up with that data, it's like, you're not going to do anything with it. So we don't bother with it. But in the future, yeah. can I give you a real world example yeah, yeah. of this? That like I've actually used myself. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So for example, like we go into training and we assume I do this protocol and I'm going to get this result. Every time I do this protocol, I get the same result. Like it's not how the body works. I mean, if you do five by five at 85% today and you do it next week, you're coming in with a different physiologic state. So it's always like the protocol plus the context is what gets you the results. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the things that I've seen myself is if I start, for example, let's say like a tricep based movement, because it's so simple. It's just you straighten your arm. So let's just pick a skull crusher. Yeah. Skull crusher. I've been doing skull crushers every week for the past two months. So I come in today and I'm doing my skull crushers and I'm warming up and I see that, ooh, I'm not utilizing a lot of oxygen in my tissues today. You mean with a wearable? With a wearable. Okay. 
So like my I was muscle- like, how do you know that? <laughs> like what yeah. a nerd. Evan, Evan hey, just knows. Like, I just, I just threw the, I through just the range of motion. Close really my eyes and I'm just oxygen. thinking, I'm like, Ooh, no, no <laughs> oxygen today, friends. <laughs> So I could see the data. I could see, ooh, I'm not getting a lot of oxygen utilization in my tissues today. And I see my skin temperature and I'm like, ah, skin temperature is a little lower than usual. And uh, I'm getting less blood flow to my muscles. Well, what does this mean? Well, maybe I have more muscle damage than usual. usual. Maybe I'm more fatigued. It doesn't really matter the cause. But my tissue is not in a place to respond to this hypertrophy protocol. I could go do my sets, but metabolism, my tissue is impaired. Like I'm not really going to get much out of it. Mm-hmm. So we could know that. And I could say, okay, well, maybe I pick something that I can do today. Maybe I train a different muscle group or I try a different protocol and make sure my tissue is actually getting the proper response. Mm-hmm. That's something I've personally done because, I mean, I look at my data on a normal basis and a good example of this. So my wife, Rand, and I went to Ireland a few months ago and I took an entire week off of training, which I almost never do. I came back, jumped right into my normal training program. First day I'm monitoring my data. Everything looks awesome. If in fact it looks better than usual because I'm actually well rested. Yeah. That's the the case for strength training. When you take the week off, you come back and strength training feels so good. The idea of less is more later. But So I'm like, Oh my God, I'm the strongest human being. Like this feels amazing. And next day I come in one, I didn't feel great. I was a lot more sore. I typically don't get sore. So I was like, Oh, that's weird. Like, I'm actually pretty sore and I typically train full body almost every day. And I come and I start monitoring my data and I'm like, huh, nothing's going on in my triceps. Like when you say nothing's going on, what, what does that mean? Like, um, doing mechanical work and oxygen is not being utilized in the tissue. Okay. Blood flow isn't changing to a meaningful degree. Uh, skin temperatures colder than usual. And I'm like, okay, let me try this on my delt. Huh? Same thing. Let me try it on my hamstring. Huh? Same thing. This was the day you were feeling strong. This is the day after. Oh, the so day after. So Dad's feeling Sorry. strong. Like the ranges and values that I was seeing were way bigger than usual. I'm like, oh my God, I'm utilizing a ton of oxygen. I have a huge change in blood flow. because so I'm recovered. Next day I'm sore. Very different case. Hmm. So I'm like, huh, well, obviously if I was trying to improve my performance and that was my number one goal, I would see that and I would say, I'm not going to train these things today because clearly my tissues aren't in that place because my job is to experiment with these things, I'm going to say, I'm just going to do my entire workout anyway and just see what happens. Mm-hmm. And I finish my workout. I come in, I'm analyzing the data, comparing it to previous sessions. And just like everything is so blunted that I'm like, it probably served me no real benefit to do that training on that day because my tissues really were not responding in any meaningful way. So that's something that for an athlete, they would start that session. We would see that in their data and we would say, you know what? It's really not even worth you, worth it for you to do this. Let's train another quality that you could benefit from. Yeah. Do some actual recovery work to make it so that you so, can get especially something Especially for someone who session. has a goal. Right? Yeah. Like, like if for, you're the lay public and you're just trying to get some exercise, maybe you don't care that it's not ideal. Yeah. But, but didn't it, that just become a wasted session essentially? Like so, if you're the general public and, and you're there are other things that you could do in place of that. W- that would just be more yeah. effective. For so you. like if someone were like, my goal is literally just to go in and burn calories, for example, it's like, oh, I mean, you're probably doing that. But like if your goal is to create hypertrophy, improve strength, improve endurance, and you are seeing, uh, you are not seeing the reactions that you want, you should probably train something else and take advantage of your time. So for a CrossFit athlete or for a fighter, you have so many different things you need to do in the context of a week that maybe some rearrangement of the week would make more sense. So you could take advantage of what you can train that day and you could quickly adjust things on the fly. Yeah. Like so, a f- use the example of a fighter, right? So if that mm-hmm. was a scheduled strength training session, yeah. but they, their body wasn't responding mm-hmm. well to strength training, they could easily do a tactical mm-hmm. session or something yeah. like that in place of it. And I know we're talking about like a very reactive approach. Like, oh, I'm like tweaking everything in my training on the fly. That could be really stressful for people. So another way to use this, it's more practical is, I just created a new training split for myself. I'm going to do it for two weeks and monitor my day-to-day responses and see patterns and see, oh, on Tuesday, I'm doing this like pretty intense strength training session every Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I come in, I'm doing some form of high intensity intervals. And I see, ah, those intervals, I'm not seeing what I want. I need to reconfigure my training week. I'm not going to be reactive doing this like every week, tweaking things on the fly. I'm just going to use this data to figure out how do I arrange all these different pieces within my training week to make sure I'm actually benefiting from each individual thing to the greatest degree that I can. Maybe some things are more important than others 
and you account for that information, but it's just uh, structuring the way that your body is responding to instead of like best practices and strength and conditioning, which are the average person. That level of objectivity and adjustment typically requires a coach, right? Mm -hmm. So like if I create a new training split for someone and two weeks in, we notice that, you know, the Tuesday session is Mm -hmm. affecting the Wednesday session, then we're going to make adjustments to the template. Mm -hmm. But when I've coached myself or working with, you know, you know, I've surrounded by athletes that coach themselves and, you know, follow template programs Mm -hmm. and things like that. A lot of times they don't have the objectivity to look at it and say, Mm -hmm you know, my performance on Wednesday is suffering because of what I'm doing on yeah. Tuesday consistently. Like they don't even recognize that. Yeah. And that's where I think a benefit of still having a coach is let's say the average person is one, it's creating that training split in the first place. But when you see that, you know, things aren't configured the right way, you still need to know what to do next yeah, I was to ask reconfigure. You, when AI, like in the nearer future, do you still feel that the AI uh, machine learning stuff is still going to involve the coach athlete relationship yeah. and they'll so, just be utilizing that stuff? Yeah. And I think, so this is where I say humans are so good at some things and machines are so good at some things, but so weak in other areas and they complement each other in such a beautiful way that I really do believe the combination of a human and machine working together. Like a lot of times people talk about, oh, AI is beating human players in Go now. It's like the next level of intelligence. What they typically forget to leave out is that a human and AI team beats an AI in Go. So Mm -hmm. it's the human machine combination is better than either in isolation. Like maybe AI is better at humans in something when you team them together. Yeah. And then maybe them taking that side of the, taking a little of that mm-hmm. load allows the human to do the more human thing. Yeah. The things better. that they're good at. So that's the argument that I would make is like, like coaching the other human yeah. involved. So like for Kyle, for example, the things that he is really amazing at and AI would not be good at and the things that he's still good at, but are probably very time consuming and really not a good use of his skills. And AI would be able to offload. So imagine if Kyle could spend instead of uh, 30 hours kind of mixing half of it spent on the things I'm good at half is kind of like redundant tasks. Okay. Spend that 30 hours, all of it on things that are worth your time. You could work with even more athletes and even greater depths. So I think even it's like that human machine combination. Like in that example, it's like if you could get AI to help you do the inserting of the program side of things, you could spend more time hands on or virtually eyes on with a client. You know, I, I still have this, this hang up though, because I'm a coach and because I'm a programmer and have, and have done this for a long time, I would have this hang up of giving the reins of program design to AI or machine learning or mm-hmm. whatever it might be like, that would be a challenge for me. Mm-hmm. So what I would want to do is still continue to create like the direction and structure of the mm-hmm. week and everything. Yeah, and yeah. then, and then ask AI like, all right, write this piece of, of training or something like yeah, that. And I, just, I, I would struggle with giving up the range. We're even talking about, it could just be as simple as user interface. So like maybe you drag a little box over a training week and you say like, we have this person's performance data. We have their biomarker data. Red flag things for me. That okay, would be now awesome. you can make a decision or like, hey, you know, you've seen me progress training for the past, I mean, at this point, what, 15 years? So on this day, based on this, like drag and drop, what would be the progression that I would make? Yeah, what's the and next step for this person? it will make a progression that you're, you would look at and you'd be like, yeah, that's exactly what I would do. And even there's training wheels. So maybe you start and you do it and it gives a progression and you're like, not what I want. Say, that's not what I want. Another day you say, that is what I want. Over time it learns, what does Kyle want? What is he rewarding me for and penalizing me for? And again, we're acting like there's some kind of intelligence. This is again, just literally working with spreadsheets to do this thing and feeding that into your model. But if you had the right user interface, it doesn't need to be invasive. It doesn't need any be you relinquishing control. It could be customized drag and drop tools for you that you use to speed up your own program design and iterate quicker. So you don't need to do like the little rote tasks that like as a coach, you feel like it's not really the best use of your time, especially when you could be like analyzing athletes movement, talking to people, dealing with their psychology. Yeah. Working with the the human side of, of the coaching equation, which is Mm -hmm. in all honesty, you know, having, having coached now for close to 20 years, it's, it's the most important part Mm -hmm. of coaching. Like I love the program design side. And I Mm -hmm. think that, uh, you know, there's, there's always things, there's always places to tinker and learn and be creative Mm -hmm. on the program design side, but that's not the most important component of coaching. Like still in the end, you know, 
coaching the human is the most important mm-hmm. part. And thankfully, you know, we, a lot of people have talked about AI replacing jobs and, and things like that. And like chat GPT, you know, people firing whole sections of, I, I think that they're, that coaching in general is a relatively safe field mm-hmm. because the human interaction and human side of it, communication. You agree with this, Evan? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, I, I, I don't want to agree for you. So no, I mean, I do agree with that. We were talking about yesterday off air, totally really different conversation. But one of the things that you find is in CrossFit, you have a lot of like elite athletes who for whatever reason, their like physiological makeup makes them really good at CrossFit. But in the grand scheme, they would be not that good strength athletes, not that good endurance athletes. Maybe they're not that coordinated. So you have some people that, you know, they were never really an athlete growing up. They might've not even played sports and they start CrossFit in their late teens or mid twenties or thirties. Yeah. And all of a sudden, not using her as this specific example, but you have people like that where all of a sudden they're a world-class athlete, but they have no competition experience. Maybe they haven't developed like the psychological coping skills to deal with the pressure and competing and things like that. And for them, like you're not going to figure out a better training program to get them better. It's the like mental, emotional, tactical things that they need to learn. And yeah, maybe a machine could do some of those, but I don't think most people want to open themselves up and be vulnerable to basically a aim chat bot that is souped up and to that point, you know, Max and I had a, a podcast conversation recently where we talked about, you know, what are, what are the ways that you approach coaching, you know, up and coming athletes mm-hmm. versus coaching your, your, you know, experienced top level mm-hmm. games, you know, experienced games competitors. And the thing that he talked about is like, it, it's not really all that different. Mm-hmm. Like you're coaching the human, you're teaching them, yeah. Uh, how to cope with emotions, Mm -hmm. how to think about competing in the sport, how to, you know, surround themselves with the right team to Mm -hmm. help them. It's, it's it's all all dependent on the individual you're talking to. Yeah. And this is where like, it's not just physiology. Like one of the interesting things is in studies with elite athletes and like general population, people are like, Oh, elite athletes have like this insane pain tolerance. Like they don't feel pain. Definitely not the case. They feel pain the same as you and I, if you were to like, you know, we take a random person off the street that's never exercised and maybe Kyle here and we start like electrically stimulating their muscle and we're like, at what point does this become painful? Kyle would probably say it becomes painful at the same point, but you keep going and Kyle's able to either tolerate it for longer, take more amounts of pain in it's not because he doesn't feel it. It's that athletes develop the psychological strategies to cope with pain. They have more pain coping strategies and better. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is people think, oh, they're like good at ignoring the pain or blocking it out. Actually, that's not what they do. They figure out how to directly engage with the pain. So if anything, they really feel it more than the average person, but that's a skill that you could only learn under pressure say, is there testing. Any cool science on that? that I remember I had an athlete years ago and his whole goal is he was like growing up, like I was talented at sports but I never got good at any of them because he called it like I wasn't tough. But what it really was is he was always trying to find a trick to like not feel the pain when he would run or play these sports. And what he hired me for is to like help him figure out a trick because he's like, I have the physiology, like I want to win, but like, you know, I just don't really want to feel pain. And what we ended up doing in his training that helped is we didn't teach him any tricks. We just gradually exposed him to increasingly uncomfortable things. And what he learned to do is develop little mental coping strategies to deal with it to where you could keep kind of increasing it over time. So it's those types of things that like, yeah, maybe you could figure out a way to automate training to treat the physiology more, but like that's not going to help you develop cognitive coping strategies. Like an athlete is probably going to want to talk to someone that's done it before like not read a book, you know, get in the weeds, talk about what are you feeling? Like, what are some of the strategies that you've done, Kyle? Like, I'd like to try that. And yeah, to that point, I think, you know, Evan's talking about coping strategies and it seems like this, you know, kind of ethereal, ephemeral thing. Like that's not, yeah, I it, mean, maybe what are some it's, of yours? It's simple stuff. Like, okay, you're doing a set of 20 and you count it in sets of four. Yeah. Right. So it's like you count to four or five times for yeah. your set of 20, like simple, simple things and, like that can, can make dealing with the, the pain of exercise so much more manageable. Mm -hmm. And part of, you know, you were talking about experience. If you're, if you're constantly running away from the discomfort of Mm -hmm. exercise, then you never learn how to deal with those coping strategies. Because what you do is you just put the 
say it's a set of 20 wall ball, you know, heavy wall ball. You just put the ball down because mm-hmm. you, you, you're trying to avoid the pain versus yeah. the person who is trying to come up with strategies to, you know, kind of teach themselves yeah. to work through the pain where they figure out, oh man, if I just think about these in sets of four, I can always mm-hmm. just do one, two, three, four. Yeah. Now I'm going back one, two, you, you know, but it's simple things like the that. Important thing though, is it has to emerge authentically. Like I can't just go and like, that is not a strategy that I've used. So I can't just go into a Metcon right now and say, I'm just going to change how I count. It's not going to make it hurt any less for me. It's each person has to develop these things authentically. So for example, is, when like, I was, deal- sorry, no, I didn't know you yeah, were like, when I was like running competitively, the one that I would thought of is like, we were always like, oh, you know, avoid the pain in the last lap. I ran the mile in the 800, which are horrible events. So a game that I made up for myself is you flip the script and say, my goal on the back straightaway is to make this hurt as much as possible. And that is the reward. So if I am doing that, that is winning. That's how you get your points. So it almost made it like a pleasurable experience because you're like, okay, I know it's about to get nasty. Like I'm going to do even better than last time by making this hurt more. And the way that you do that is by pushing yourself harder. So instead of being scared of it or avoiding it, it made that the goal, which would have a positive performance outcome. So like that was a coping strategy that I didn't read somewhere. It just happens. So I think there's a lot of things like that, that they just have to emerge. But importantly, you can't listen to me say that and go try that and have yeah. it work for you. It's probably not going to work. You could try it and it might work. It for might you. work, but right? it might it's, not. it's an idea. It's one, it's one of many options. Chris, you were, oh, you were I was going gonna to say mine is push. Like it's always tied to music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And especially if I'm familiar with the music, mm-hmm. if it's a song that I don't know, it's playing, it doesn't work. But if it's a song I'm deeply familiar with, I can always, you know, who knows if I'm making this up, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty sure that my pain tolerance, I can push through things way crazier if it's like a song that I am truly invested mm-hmm. in. And I, it doesn't even have to be a pump song. It doesn't need to be yeah. like the pump, but it's just something that I'm like feeling on an emotional level. Boom. That's the ones that I can like. That's actually been directly yeah. studied that it's specifically like a song that has some kind of emotional like reaction for you specifically does actually have like real ergogenic benefits. Huh. You know, the challenge for that for CrossFit competitors is that you're not in control of your environment on mm-hmm. game day. So anything that's an external cue for you is something that you're not in control of. Mm-hmm. You don't get to pick the playlist at Wadapalooza when yeah. you're out on the floor. And so there's the challenge for that. But I also saw that leveraged by, you know, if you go back and watch Michael Phelps, you know, mm-hmm. all through the year swimming, he always had his his headphones on before the race. And that's exactly what they were doing. So he had his playlist of, of pump up tracks mm-hmm. and basically would be just blaring it until the moment that he stepped up on the block to race leveraging mm-hmm. a lot of that old sports. Yeah. It's not even old, but that old sports psychology research. Yeah, and I think that's one that like most people will be familiar with. Like most people at competitions you see in like the back room, everyone has their headphones and they're trying to use music to do that. But I think there's also things that you could do in events that you develop in your oh. own training. Ooh, sorry. On that same note, I have been able to replicate that when moments where it's like, it's quiet or it's a song I don't like. I just sing the song in my head Yeah, and it works. So I used to get in these loops when I would run like in painful interval sessions where sometimes it would be songs. I was just like, oh, I kind of like that song. And in my head, it would just like, I could hear the same like 40 second segment from the song just I'm looping blue, over and over. <laughs> yeah. I mean that the Reese's Puffs, uh, serial <laughs> theme yeah, hit song. Us with that real quick. I'm not going to do it on the mic and, uh, Come on. people don't no, make to hear do that. No, I'm not going to make him do <sighs> it. Yeah. I, I distinctly remember it. This was in middle school practice. Yeah, chocolate flavor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Stanley steamer commercial. I don't know if anyone is one 800 steamers. No, oh, yeah. maybe that's like a Northeast region. Uh, I feel like I've heard that. There's so much wasted data. I like JG Wentworth in our brains. Yeah. JG Wentworth. Eight seven seven cash now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's so much wasted data storage in our brains from watching commercials as, as children. Like, so uh, this is going to get into the the weeds here and probably not a conversation that we should get into. However, uh, we've, we've just filled up so much of our cognitive space with junk, having consumed all these commercials and stuff throughout our lives. I think it's very interesting that like he says, JG Wentworth, and I know exactly what comes next. You're talking about the, how about this one? Liberty, Liberty, Mutual, God. See, See isn't I don't that even pathetic? Remember that one? Liberty Mutual didn't really exist where I was from, so yeah. I never got that one. It's kind of sad, but you know, it's a, a conversation cool for a different. Me. 
Y'all have any good like local lawyer commercials you remember? Oh yes, yeah. Selena and Barnes Injury Attorneys one eight seven seven eight hundred. Everyone from Long Island know <laughs> they that didn't one. Have a catchphrase they, or nothing? They just no. So they just awkwardly stare at the camera. You think it's a picture of Chris, them? Hold hold on, Chris. Cat's going for the uh, the board now. Oh, it's okay. He's actually going for the machine. Kyle, what about you? Any good there? lawyer? Uh, not not that I remember. Thankfully, Dang. thankfully, I didn't fill up that space. See, I I feel like I'm very um. I feel like my memory sucks, but what I don't suck at is music stuff. Like I have a music memory, so I remember all of our lawyers. I, I wish I had some some like good quip there because it's like I remember movie quotes, right? Like they no, just I don't, I don't remember those at all. No. That's why like anytime me and Mike McGoldrick are hanging out, he just spits them out all the time. And I'm just like, He's, I don't know what that is. Even if I've seen the movie, like, I don't, I don't know what you're He's talking really about. good with movie yeah. quotes, but it's weird. Like you've got your songs. He's got his movie quotes. Evan has all the data and books that he's had. Like, <laughs> in the world. Every book every, on this shelf. Every episode of Bob's Burgers that's ever been made. Oh, I could probably quote it. Um, to be I clear, saw season one of that. I haven't kept up though. Before we started this podcast, I was just kind of going through the books and like, I would see an interesting title and I was like, tell me about this. And Evan was giving me the TLDR of each of the books. And it's like, he remembers everything that he read earlier today. I was talking to Chris and he was like, yeah, I got this really good book that I read. Couldn't remember the name or <laughs> what it said. I, all I remembered was the feeling that it was good. Yeah. And that makes Sometimes me so that's sad. It's depressing, it, dude. I like the amount you were talking about wasted space. Listen to the jingles wasted. It's like, I read all this stuff and I'm in, infinitely curious and I go down these rabbit holes and I retain exactly nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, you know, I think that, there, there's something to be said for tying all of like your knowledge together. And if it's not something that, you know, connects to something that you already understand, like part of the reason that I think someone like Evan can take the information that he reads in each of these books and then retain it is because it's tied back to his model of the world, which is coaching and physiology. Yeah. And I was going to say, keep in mind, I don't remember everything I read. I okay. remember the things that I teach. So that's why for me, I'm like the best way to learn something is to teach it. It's like, oh, why do I know so much physiology? I didn't, I mean, if I think back to all the things I studied in college, I could not tell you, actually I could, I don't remember much biochemistry. I don't remember much molecular biology or any of these things that I spent like literally 20 hours a week reading because I never taught anyone it. But cardiovascular physiology, muscle physiology, all these things, I could like literally repeat back sections from textbooks because I've written them so many times. I've spoken these things. I've put them into courses. So that's where like going back to the decoding biology thing, like why make a sub stack about it? It's more selfishly that if I have to teach it and take the information, mold it into a way that's digestible for someone, now I remember it forever. So, I mean, huh. I think that's the key to remembering well, now that we're back on the sub stack, um, what in the one, the AI one, mm -hmm. what, um, are some of the most popular, what would you call it? Blogs? Yeah. Yeah. So the most popular one is probably like a, like a total end to end project where I literally just got a data set of a bunch of people's like fMRI brain scan data and their clinical dementia ratings. And I built a model like from scratch, like this is how you clean and process the data. This is how you- What is clean and process? What is so that? So basically data has to be in a form that's useful for a machine learning model. The models are stupid. It's just math. So if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. So data is very rarely formatted in a way that's useful for you. So when you feed, let's say my spreadsheet has a brain volume, that's a real thing, like uh, this specific measure of the brain so for each input, you need to figure out like, what is the distribution? Is it like a bell shaped curve? Is it like a very skewed distribution? All of these different things you need to figure out how do I transform that? So maybe it's like a very skewed distribution. I want to normalize it. Other machine learning models work on scale. So it's like distance based measures. So if one of my variables is like driving distance and one is walking distance, those are going to be totally different scales. And the model may weigh the driving distance more heavily because it's bigger numbers. So you'd have to normalize it and put them on the same scale. So all of the data that you're putting into the model, you need to figure out like, what am I even trying to predict? How do I clean this data, make it look good? Like Now, as we go forward, like say mm -hmm. 10 years in the future, will, will that kind of stuff get better at cleaning it for you? Or will culture get better at um, 
you know, just having, you know, yeah, setting yeah. things up so that they're not having mm -hmm. messy data to begin with. Yeah, you could store data in better ways, but at the end of the day, a machine won't be able to do it for you because you need context. So for example, like let's say we are looking at, Kyle and I were talking about an athlete's VO2 data that he saw recently. If you didn't know VO2 and you're not familiar with the measurement, you might be going through your spreadsheet and you're like, oh, 64, 30, uh, 55, whatever. And then you see uh, 87 and you just keep going. But me and Kyle would see that and we're like, 87? Like, who is this person? Who is this person? If you see it's like Eliud Kipchoge, you're like, oh yeah, it makes sense. Totally cool. And you see instead you're like, 74-year-old says they don't exercise. Okay, that's garbage data. We're deleting that column because that's going to mess up our model because mm -hmm. it's probably entered incorrectly. Maybe the sensor malfunctioned. So there's a lot of context-dependent stuff. Sometimes you also have to design your own features. Like, for example, I was working with the data set recently. had an accelerometer data, X acceleration, Y, Z. I know the formula for total acceleration, so I'm like, I'm going to make a new feature out of the data that the sensor got. So you do that. That's called cleaning your data, processing it. Um, that's honestly like 80% of developing systems is knowing how to clean and process your data. Okay. So now I say, okay, I'm going to take my queen's data. I'm going to try like 20 different machine learning algorithms to predict my output. And I'm going to see which of them does the best. Mm. Then I'll pick two or three of those and say, well, I'm only going to spend the rest of my time like tweaking these. Yeah. So then you take those and you say, okay, we have these models working. So let's say I have 20 types of input data that I'm using. Which of these matter the most? Which of these matter the least? You want to remove the inputs that are not important, have as few inputs that are as important. So that's called feature selection. You're selecting the features that are most relevant for your model. So now we've, features, we've cleaned my data. We've selected the features that are most important in context of the algorithm we're using. Now we're going to tweak the different parameters in the model. So like linear regression is kind of like a dumb model. There's just no real parameters to tweak. There's no things that are being weighed. But some models have more things that you could tweak. So it's like tuning knobs up and down, finding out what works. You could do that manually, or you could use algorithms that try like thousands of different combinations of things and find them for you. But generally, you know, it's some combination of the two, depending on the project. So then what you need to do after that is you kind of like codify your model. You're like, I just spent so much time building this thing. Like, could I automate all of this now? Then you might want to deploy it in the real world and see... And all, all along these ways, you're evaluating the model at every step. And now we're saying, if I take like some random person's data, is the prediction it's making accurate? And then you go back and you're always tweaking things. So it sounds overly complicated, but at the end of the day, it's like if you come in some basic programming skills, like you know a programming language. Okay, so here's my question then. Do you recommend people who are interested to actually get into learning programming or encoding or is mm. that like a waste of their time or is it still beneficial so i mean at the end of that it's like what's the goal of it like if they're just doing it for fun i mean it's like learning guitar you would say like oh i spend like 10 week hours a week playing guitar i have a guitar teacher and you're like is it fruitful is it a waste of time and mm. they're like well i'm not like in a rock band i'm not making yeah, money yeah, but yeah. like i like doing it yeah. So like you know for them it's fine same thing with machine learning. Like, oh, I spend 20 hours a week doing this. Is it worth it? They say it's worth it. I mean, for some people, it's a career. For some people, it's kind of augmenting their skills. Well, for instance, right now on your bookshelf, you have what four books right there about Python, which is a mm -hmm. coding language, right? Yeah, programming right? language, yeah. Um, for instance, is that going to be relevant? Is Python, or is, it, is are we going to fast forward 10 years and Python's mm -hmm. not relevant? So I'm, I, I have, have such a wide, um, I have no... I don't yeah, know what so I'm talking I'd about, say so that if, might be a dumb question. If you are interested in machine learning, it's like for a language, it's like, I mean, for example, you want to learn a second language, and you ask me, you're like, should I learn uh, Greek or should I learn German? And I'm like, well, I mean, in Europe, more people speak German than Greek. Yeah. Well, like, does that mean Greek is better? Like, maybe you're like, I well, you. I want to learn how to read the Iliad and its original text. I'm like, well, then take Greek. Like, take ancient yeah. Greek, coin Greek, not German. So same thing. If you're interested in machine learning, Python's probably the most useful language because it's the most commonly used for that. But it's only the most commonly used because people decided that. Yeah. So it could always change. And there's like general skills that transfer from one language to another, like Python and R are similar. But like I couldn't go look at what's called like C++. I'd be like, I mean, I could kind of figure out what's going on here. Yeah. But like if you ask me to do something useful, I'm probably going to create a lot of bugs and just like screw up a bunch. 
No, I was I was listening to uh, Mark Andreessen on mm-hmm. Lex Friedman's podcast, and he was talking about some sort of coding where mm-hmm. you could have mistakes, and mm-hmm. it would recognize that there was a mistake and yeah. clean it for you. Yeah, is there stuff like that with the uh, machine learning where you said you got to clean your data, where they'll train it to to clean yeah. to do the cleaning for you? So yeah, like debugging is always going to be a thing. So if you you could screw up your code in a way that your code still runs, which is the worst because you might not know that something is going wrong. Like that's where you really have like an insidious bug is like, I really screwed something up, but it doesn't impact the code from actually functioning and running. Those are really hard to find because generally you don't know that there's a problem. Mm. There's other ways that you could mess up what's called like syntax. It would be the equivalent of like, if you wrote something with improper grammar in the English language, if your Microsoft word processor just like stopped you from writing and it's like, no, you go and fix that. The problem is, doesn't really fully tell you what's wrong. Would you say like, Kyle, your grammar is bad. Do something about it. And maybe <laughs> the it would, lines underneath it. Right? Yeah, and maybe yeah. it would give you like some kind of like really vague warning where it's like your grammar is bad. Like fix syntax. You're like, okay, at least I know my syntax is bad. It's not my spelling. Most, uh, that's more of like the interface that you program in will give you error warnings, but like you still need to go and figure out where the error is. Sometimes that could be the most time consuming thing. Like I know I screwed something up. I know generally the region in the code that it is, but I don't really know what the problem is. That's where there's websites like Stack Exchange that you could just like take your error warning, put it in there and people... I got to apologize to the audience because I got us off track and now we've been down a rabbit yep. hole. You were talking about cleaning the code mm-hmm. or cleaning the uh, data, yeah. data f- because you, I asked you your most popular blog post in that sub stack mm-hmm. yep. and it was about Alzheimer's. Yeah. So predicting you, so clinical dementia ratings. So what was the, uh, like, why was that so popular? Yeah. So I think it's, um, it really from talking to people, like help them understand how these things work. Like I'm literally showing you, this is the data I'm downloading off like a public database. Anyone could get it. I'm showing you step by step. This is how you clean data. Like you could see my code and I'm explaining why I'm doing everything and where things fit in, in the grand scheme. What I found when I was learning how to code and work on machine learning projects is all of the books that you could find are written by people that have PhDs in machine learning and tend to only be able to explain things to people with PhDs in machine learning. So they never really take a step back to abstract and say, like, where does this even fit into the grand scheme of things? So what I would do is I'd kind of create logic models of, like, this is how a project works from end to end. This is why I'm doing this and where it fits into the larger context. So you could understand, oh, why am I cleaning my data now? One of the things that's confusing as hell is I was explaining, like, I clean my data, then I... uh, you know, select my algorithms and I select my features. When you learn machine learning, no one tells you the order to do these things. So what I was doing is basically walking you through a project, explaining exactly why step by step. Yeah. Showing you my code, showing like how we might go back and forth between steps. And then at the end of the model, I give you the end result. You could take this model and go use it. You could go get an fMRI and put your own data into it and it will spit out a prediction but more importantly, you will know why it is spitting out that prediction. So yeah, that one did pretty well. I feel like that's a common problem with education in general Mm -hmm. that they teach you about the topic, Mm -hmm. right? Like think about education in the coaching world. I'd say that's like when, I mean, how many people do you know you have a master's in sport physiology? Obviously you write programs for a living, but what you know is those are two very different things. I bet a lot of people finished that master's program and they had no idea how to write a training program. It's the same thing. You could go do a master's in machine learning, do well on the test, do well on like the coding challenges they give you, and then finish it and realize that you actually don't know how to do these. I mean, that essentially happened to me. I went through like a pretty intensive schooling process on this stuff, did really well. And then started working with real world data sets where things are not perfect and they're not clear. It's like, I have no idea what's going on right now. Well, it's the same problem in, in coaching. I mean, you know, they call coaching, it's one aspect of coaching is program design, yeah. right? And I think a lot of people wonder like, where do I even start? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a similar, it's a, it's a common problem mm-hmm. between programming for machine learning yeah. and program design for a client, like Mm -hmm. where, where do I even start? Like I have all these protocols. I learned about, you know, movement training Mm -hmm. and endurance training from Evan. And I learned about strength training and all these things, but I don't even know where to start to plug it in. And that's where the funny thing is like, I'm not like a world-class machine learning engineer, but I've spent 
a lot of years building courses on topics that I do have more experience in. So even making the sub stack, I've been personally contacted by tons of people that have PhDs in bioinformatics or data science or machine learning. And they're like, oh, this is like amazing. These are so good. And it, they're like, you know, like, what's your background? I'm like, I mean, I've done like a few months of schooling in this, but they're always surprised that I don't really have any formal education. But it's because I've just taken all the things I learned from building courses and use that. So like, it seems like there's more, for example, in physiology, like, I mean, even before I had like a graduate degree or anything, I was making these courses and at TTT, we would talk to people with PhDs in physiology and they would think that we knew more than we did. And it's like, no, we just know how to organize the information that we know. Probably don't have as many raw facts as you, but it's just a cohesive framework. So you know where things fit in when you learn yeah, information. I mean, in in the program design or coaching world, it's like you you do your consult and, mm -hmm. and do your testing and then you gather data and you have to know what to do mm -hmm. with that data, yeah. which is similar to the process you were yeah. talking about of cleaning the data to feed it into the machine learning models. And then you go in and you run mm -hmm. your algorithm. So if the person needs to develop strength, mm -hmm. you run your strength algorithm. Yeah. So it's as, as you were talking, you know, earlier we said that you integrate information into the models. Well, mm -hmm. obviously all of my models are physiology and yeah. coaching related. And so like, as I was listening to you explain machine learning, that's how my brain was, yeah. was integrating. It's, I think all. it almost points out that you, if you don't have a framework, Start by building yeah. your own frame. Like, what is yeah. your framework? Yeah. Like, literally write out everything that you know about training and, and how hard, all right? of your ideas connect. It's really hard. Like, yeah. you'll find... Maybe that's why people don't do it. Yeah, but... Or at that the end it's of evolving the day, over time. And yeah, because, like, what most people don't realize is when you think you understand concepts in a deep way, but then when you go to write it and, more importantly, explain it to someone that doesn't know them, you realize you're like, I don't know how to explain this, like... I realize I don't know these things that I thought I knew really well. And it's the process of figuring out how to convey it is where you really learn things. I think I remember early on when you were at Training Think Tank, one of the things that you created was this spreadsheet of methods. Yeah, the functional systems document. Yes, where what you were doing, and I knew what you were doing mm -hmm. because I had gone through this, a similar process, mm -hmm. not as organized as yours, but similar Um you were trying to kind of organize all the information that you had on, on training all the different components of CrossFit. And how they so, fit together. Yes. And, and how each one integrated and, and you created this spreadsheet that I ended up stealing so many things from mm -hmm. because it was finally like all of the concepts that we had talked about mm -hmm. and you and Max had developed and you and Brandon had developed and it was all in one place. It was yeah. finally organized. What did it do? It, so basically he, he created this spreadsheet that basically said, okay, if you're in the off season and you have this type of athlete, Use these things. If you are in, yeah. uh, you know, if you're in competitive prep phase. Okay, if this, then that. Yeah, it's basically like one of the things I realized is like, oh, I I know so many protocols, but when I'm actually working with an athlete and I'm, you know, when the rubber hits the road, I'm like not thinking like, oh, what are the like 30 different protocols I've heard about at some point, probably like made a note of, Kyle sent me via email, like these things aren't coming to my You're mind. you just hoping that that day you could pull yeah, it out like, of your ass. If you showed it to me, I'd be like, oh yeah, I recognize that. So like I've all even the done time, it before. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I remember like a lot of it, I was mining emails like me, Kyle, Max sent back and forth. I'd look at old programs I wrote. And I'm like, oh, that's a good protocol. I don't even remember writing that. It was so long ago, but like I get what it's doing. So it was essentially a document that organized all of that. I have this type of athlete, this part of the season, this is the goal that I have. And it would basically be a list of here are all the different protocols that would make sense here. This is how you write them and how do you progress them? So like I have a document on my computer. It's like a network graph and it's labeled second brain. So I basically just everything I read, everything I want to remember, I put in there in the way that it works. Wow. Give me an example. I'm going to start yeah. doing this. <laughs> so it's actually, it's an awesome app. It's called Rome Research. And basically what it is is- Rome, spell it. Uh, R-O-A-M. So the way that like a social network works, for example, is let's say um, I've never met Chris. So I know Kyle. So I'm a point. Kyle's a point. There's a line between us. Kyle knows Chris. So now there's a line from Kyle to Chris and Kyle to me. And then it might recommend, like Facebook says, hey, you might know this person. It's because, like, say now uh, Max is here. Max also knows Chris, and I know Max. So I'm connected to Kyle and Max. They're both connected to Chris. Oh, Evan, you probably know Chris. You know, so then we make that connection. What Rome does is it's, it's called a network 
graph or a network database. So it's a note taking app that you write a note, you know, just normal note, but then you could tag other notes that it's similar to, and it creates like those and lines it's a between database? them. Yeah, it's a network database. So, for example, when so I, I don't want to put anything crazy in those notes. So, what, what <laughs> I do, mine is private and the data saved on my computer. So, like, you couldn't access it. But when I was doing my master's, every lecture that I had, I would take, make that a note. And then, like, say this lecture is on, like, uh, cancer pharmacology. Mm-hmm. I would think, I would start typing in some keywords. It has, like, slick ways of tagging things, kind of like a hashtag type yeah. function. And I would start like searching other documents that have either like CAR T cells, which is a therapy for cancer, like uh, ovarian cancer, dot, dot, dot. And I would connect them. So then when I finished my master's, it's like one, there's like 500 So dots. that would connect you with other people's notes on the no, same no, topic? Only mine, only mine. So it's localized. So when I go in there, I see like 500 dots on the screen and all of the connections between the dots. But what oh, allows so me to do your own notes. Yes. Got it. And it's creating like a second brain. So now I go in there and one day I'm like, man, I want to know about kidney disease. So I type in kidney disease and it lights up all of the little nodes that have something related to kidney disease. And it like lights up the connections between them. So out of those 500 dots, like 20 of the dots are lit up and the connections between them are lit up now I could go in there and quickly find information that I know because I put in there and figure out like, what do I want to know? What is it connected to within the rest of my knowledge base? And one of the things that I found that was kind of amazing using this is there's things that you intuitively know, but you'd have never made the connections with. So like if I was writing an essay on the topic, I would look in my own note database and I would realize all of these like crazy connections that I would never think of. So then I started populating like a lot of the things that I wrote for training think tank I would put in there and I would connect them with the medical physiology and pharmacology that I did my master's on. I started putting machine learning information I was learning into there. So now I have like a thousand nodes in there and I could see how all of them are connected. That's how your brain works. I mean, that is literally what it means for ideas to be related to one another in your mind. But it's a external is version of it so what's so cool about it is like i don't have most of that information on recall like if you opened a random node and asked me a question i'm like i might not even be able to define the term but if i search it in there i could read that note and then quickly read the thing that it's connected to and it lights up your memory and you're like oh i remember this like i could start jamming on this Mm. so how how far away are we and i mean we started this conversation about ai but how far away are we from being able to to plug those notes in and then let AI create those connections essentially, mm-hmm. or even populate new notes based on the, yeah. the connections between information. So I think like on statistical connections, but I think more importantly is the, uh, your own associations of how those things connect. So I think there needs to be like an emotional resonance there. And you, I think the process of you making those connections and flagging them is a really critical component of it. Because now when I go back in there, and I start reading one note and I see its connections and I start reading it like sparks my memory of, oh, I remember where I was at when I was doing this and like why I tagged this and that. So I think you would lose something by automating a lot of that. And I think the same thing, like if you were to just like go through all my email and generate notes, I think it misses the point. I think it's the fact that you are the one building it. You are creating like a second brain for yourself that houses all of these things that you've learned. I think that's kind of what makes it magical. Is this a free app? Uh, there's a free version, or I think the paid one is like ten, fifteen dollars a month. It's nothing crazy. Yeah. Um. So Chris yeah. and I have talked about how bad our memories are, and to that point, I feel like this would be something that would be really beneficial because, mm-hmm. hey, cat, hey, tell a story. Uh, there have been times where Evan has sent me an email or sent me a blog to review, and there's a paragraph in there, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, man, you know, this paragraph was, I know <laughs> was really well written. And Evan will respond with, yeah, that's because you wrote it. And I was like, oh, shit. I wrote that? It's really good. To yeah. the point, like, Well, it was when we were making courses together. So, like, I would go through notes that you sent me, and I would put your notes into the course, and you're like, this is really good stuff. Like, where did you learn this? And I'm like, Dude, you literally sent me this like six months ago. <laughs> I I need this this mind map <laughs> because I can't even remember what I wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Let's do some uh, rapid fires. Evan, why do we laugh? <laughs> <laughs> what a, on the spot. I don't know. You have any uh, ideas, any guesses? I have no idea. Like what's the uh 
Come on, man. It's not where I thought you were going to go. With this. You're smarter I, than me. I genuinely have no idea. Huh? I, I re- it's a it's a social it's a way to socially connect and show the emotion of humor. Is that like, like an evolved signaling? Yeah. Mechanism? Here's a real question I have. Okay, and this is everyone I've brought this up to, which has been two people so far, <laughs> instantly say no, and I understand why. But I'm I'm being sincere. Do you think in the same way that like you know if you don't exercise like intentionally in the modern day, you know maybe back in our mm-hmm. ancestors did it naturally, but we're just chilling in the AC. And so we got to get out there and move. Do you think in the same way that there might be an extreme need or an unknown need for us to be tickled? <laughs> tickled? Yeah, actually tickled. Cause uh, like, I, I'd say no. Cause I what hate if mis- being tickled. I know you do. Yeah. But don't, do you hate exercise? Well, I mean, no, you actually, grow to love it, but could you grow to love tickling? And are we missing out on something by not being tickled? Mm. Come on, I, really, I really, so. really sit with this and be it, sincere with it. It does for a raise the question of how that did evolve. Because I mean, we don't do it, but it's it's there. You could be tickled, and, and and it sucks, and you don't like it, but it is also kind of fun. There's like a cat and mouse chase to being tickled is kind of fun. Well, it's almost it's almost like it's such an annoying stimulus that we have to have a coping mechanism for it, and our body or our ner- brains and nervous systems coping and mechanism kind of is a to science laugh. experiment where we set up to see if there's any like downstream like benefits to being tickled on a regular basis. Like what if I, I change the world, dude? What if it's like, man, we for well, years, we didn't do any intentional tickling. What are you doing? With I wonder your life? if there's like some kind of like parental bonding component of that measure, like oxytocin. Oh, like for sure. Release, things like that. But yeah, I, don't know. I don't know. Come on, help me out. Don't just leave me high and dry. No. One thing I will say that is a weird reaction to you getting like manual therapy work. That's incredibly painful. And you laugh. Yeah. Like you have that response too. Yeah. So yeah, I remember like when Tony would be working on me and it would be like horribly painful and I would yeah. just start hysterically laughing and I couldn't stop laughing. That's yeah. that's but what I'm I was like, getting at. This that- isn't enjoyable and it does not tickle. It feels like he's literally putting his knee in my palm with all of his body weight. When I was saying it's a coping mechanism. Shout out Tony, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what I was getting at is that it's so annoying. It's it's so annoying, probably not the right word, but so aggravating. Yeah that your only possible response is to laugh. It's like when you smash your shin on the dishwasher door. Mm-hmm. I just did this the other day and you know, the dishwasher doors open, you smash your shin on it. What, it's not like you scream in rage or you start mm-hmm. crying. You laugh, even though it hurt like hell. Oh, speak for yourself. I scream in rage and then I just start crying. <laughs> and then you and fall into a ball into rage, or you do yeah. the thing, the family guy thing like the. All like right. That. I guess that went nowhere. So next, next <laughs> rapid fire. You got a lot of books on this bookshelf. If you listen to the audio version, there's tons. What uh, pick a couple f- that you uh, think are cool that we should check out? I know that's I, very broad, but I would say I'm interested where your mind goes with such a broad question. Anything by Oliver Sacks, dude's got like 15 books. And what's who is Literally. he and what's his shtick? So he uh, died recently. So he was a famous neurologist was not famous for most of his career. People thought the dude was crazy. No one wanted to listen to him. So basically he studies (laughs) in a different way. Um, (laughs) But he studies uh, people with like extreme, could call them neurological defects or like strange conditions um, and uses that to kind of back engineer how the mind works. So instead of saying, we're going to study a healthy brain, he'll say, well, we know this specific part of this person's brain is damaged and this is what they're experiencing. So tying those together. So like this person got hit right here. We could see a lesion on this part of their brain. And when they look out in the world, they see a fire hydrant and they think it's a child or they see a car and they're convinced that it's a flying giraffe and they genuinely see these things. So we could start to understand like, why does the brain work that way? So anything by him. What is the most uh, novel idea you've picked up from him? Like that, you know, if you never read them, you missed out on. I would say one of the big ones is, uh, that there is no such thing as normal cognitive processes. So like we all have like a general preconceived notion of like, this is what the brain should do. This is how we should interpret things. And that's very much based on like a false westernized idea. Um, in certain cultures, uh, for example, a good example, um, certain cultures have different ways that they differentiate between colors. So for example, we would say, this is red. This is also red. That is also red in based on how your culture perceives those things. You might not notice a difference. Other cultures might have a different. You're not talking about quality. You're talking about they group different things. Yeah. Into or one even category. sounds. So for example, um, there are certain languages where P's and B's. So if I say like pear, 
bear, same thing. Like they literally do not perceive any difference between p and b because they, in their language, wrong. have no differentiation. <laughs> well, Robert Sapolsky has a great example of this What's that he, he talks for? about. Uh, a lot of people in like, the CrossFit world why zebras don't get ulcers. One of his better books, in my opinion, is called Behave. It's Behave, called yeah. The that's Science it. of Humans at Their Best and Worst. He is a good example in a, like an actual uh, audio lecture that he gives where when he was in medical school, I believe the doctor that he was working for was a Finnish doctor and it's one of the languages where generally the P's and B's, uh, there's less of a distinction. So in Robert Sapolsky's work, he was supposed to uh, blow dart baboons and then basically cut open their testicles to put some kind of probe in them that measures hormonal concentrations. So he was asking this doctor, he's like, <laughs> how do I learn to do this? Like, I don't want to mess it up. And the guy said, well, you find a bear and you get the bear and you like see where there's the indentation and you take a scalpel and like, this is how you would slice it in your hand. And Robert Zapolsky's like, <laughs> and that's like safe to do. And he's like, Oh, it's completely safe. So, and the guy was like trying to be funny. He's like, the bears don't mind it. And like, I have students do this all the time. So Robert Sapolsky was like, it's like, you just find a bear and you, you know, a pair. <laughs> it was because oh. he meant a pair. Chris, wait, you weren't picking no, up I was, on I was like, what's so, happening So here? he, what, in his mind, he was saying pair, but the P's and B's, there's no differentiation because that's how his brain processes the signal. <laughs> so it's like little examples like that. Like that's more of a Sapolsky, Sachs huh. kind of crossover, but like, yeah, just your perception of color, um, how the brain processes information, like two different people really could be living in a totally different reality. So you might have like your cousin who, you know, you kind of think is a little strange or crazy. They might just be in a different reality that is no better or worse than yours. Yeah. Because the way that we perceive things isn't how things really are anyway. For sure. It's you evolve to perceive things in a certain way. Like my cat over there, he has senses that we don't have. So it's more about like that, that variability within humans is much larger than you would believe. So I, all of his books are awesome for okay. that. So Sax, uh, give us one more. Uh, ch -ch -ch. I see. I, all I can see is Putin staring me <laughs> straight in the face. What's that? So book? Raina says whenever she comes down here and your wife. sees that, she's like, it's terrifying. Why do you have that book there? It's just looking at you all the time. The other one is Oppenheimer over here staring me down. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a good book. Yeah, I like biographies. A lot of the uh, like, what, well, what's the Putin one? So the Putin one is just about like his history. So I mean, particularly, oh, it's a biography. yeah, it's a biography, non-approved by him, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, he's a global leader who shapes politics in the West. At least I didn't know really anything about him, so I want to know. Well, this guy, I obviously don't agree with his ideas, but he has a lot of power, shapes our lives in yeah. direct and indirect ways. I want to know, like, how did Evan that happen? Evan out here doing the hard work. So, yeah, I mean, that, the Oppenheimer book was a good one. I like uh, World War II history, a lot of World War II books, and obviously Oppenheimer had a huge part in that. Aren't they about to come out with the Oppenheimer movie? Oh, I haven't heard about that. I'm sure they'll mess it up, but yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, don't, I don't know Oppenheimer. Give me so, the... Um, you don't know Oppenheimer, the, bro? This is it another basically, one of uh, What? Basically, you could think of him as like the head of the Manhattan Project. He has Project. become death or whatever. Yeah, like... So, yeah, like after they tested the atomic bomb and like they just saw like the sheer destructive power, he was the one like famously quoted the Bhagavad Gita and he quoted like Shiva and said like, I've become death, the destroyer of worlds, but more in a like reluctant like, oh, oh shit, shit. Kind like of this okay. is what I just introduced to the world. And after the war ended, obviously how we know the Pacific War ended, he very much became like against what they were doing, against his own work, realized like we should have never done this. So he kind of became like villainized by the American government and public. Uh, also fun fact that I did not know until I read that book and it blew my mind is when they blew up the atomic bomb in testing, the x-rays shot out from there. And one of the guys that was in the lab watching, everyone became see-through. So like when the x-rays hit them from the atomic bomb test, he said he just saw everyone as skeletons standing in the room. That That's would have been so frightening. Crazy. And he's okay? Well, <laughs> or so he was okay? All of them developed cancer. Dang. So like yeah. every single one of them to a person that yeah, witnessed the bomb tests developed like bone cancer, really terrible cancers. Oppenheimer himself died of cancer. 
but just the fact that I didn't realize that x-rays could become visible like that. So he was like, yeah, like one of the guys was smoking a cigarette and I saw a skeleton smoking a cigarette for a few seconds. Like the other guys, like I just saw like skeletons looking out the window so and that just there, blew my mind. Do you think we'll ever have wearable tech where we could just see x-rays through it? No, what? just because you would need to be hitting the things that you're looking at with x-rays and that would be horrible for... Ah, <laughs> Chris wants x-ray glasses. That's but yeah, I mean, so yeah, those books are cool. The Sapolsky book, Behave, definitely recommend that. Um, all of you all know Harari's books, I would definitely recommend. Just like I like uh, like big picture things, understanding uh, how society what about, forms, like the history of money I like, things like that. Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah, Is that a newer book? Uh, no, well, just like the oh. general topic of like were, how there... money and financial systems work. Okay. Well, what's your main takeaway that you've liked from, from the money? History. I know yeah, that's broad, but I want to see where you're bringing like, uh, How arbitrary it is. And like, I definitely play these games myself. I'm like, oh, like how much money, you know, spending, making, that, that, et cetera. I tend to get really fixated on these things. I'm also from Long Island, so that could probably explain it if anyone <laughs> is familiar with the culture there. But just understanding like money isn't worth anything. It's paper. Paper's not worth anything. Kyle is a huge garden in his yard. He grows food more valuable than a dollar bill because you're growing the things that you make money to get anyway. Intrinsically valuable. Intrinsically valuable. So like I try and think of that and remind myself of those things. I think it's almost like you read what you want to shape your mind in a certain way to try and change your own thinking or like underlying belief structures. Nice. Well, I think we've left people with uh, plenty to chew on. Um, and we're about to run out of battery life and we need to do some hanging. So, uh, we're, again, where can they find the Substacks? <laughs> on Substack. I mean, uh, what, the yeah, names yeah. of them? Yeah. So, one is on human performance. So, again, exercise, physiology, sports performance, all that good stuff. On the other one is decoding biology and machine learning, uh, biomedical data science, all that. Noise. Kyle, <laughs> where can they find you? Don't, don't find me. No. <laughs> Kyle's like, I won't know I, that you I found got me. Rid of, so yeah, I deleted it, the Instagram app. I still have my account, but I don't, yeah. I don't interact. And on I there. recently popped back in, but I'm already thinking about popping back we, off. We passed by each other like that, you know, the yeah. meme. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, Evan, thanks again. We'll yeah, see you thanks, next guys. time.